Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. It's very nice to see so many um, people here, but hardly uh, unpredictable. Uh, this evening, I have the very great pleasure of introducing one of the most important British writers of the 20th century, and I would say so far of the 21st century as well, uh, Martin Amos. Uh, I'm sure he's no stranger to you. He was born in Swansea, South Wales in 1949 to Hilary Bardwell and her husband, the English writer Kingsley Amos. Uh, Martin is alleged to have read nothing but comic books until his stepmother, Elizabeth Jane Howard, also a novelist, lent him some Jane Austen, which must have worked because he went up to Oxford, uh, which he followed with his first job at the Times Literary Supplement. By 27, he was the literary editor of The New Statesman. Uh, he has been widely followed and read and discussed and excoriated and defended and despised, uh, admired and otherwise talked about ever since. He has a talent for controversy as well as for literature. Uh, and for all his many readers and many accolades has been uh, referred to as Britain's most hated writer. <laughs> uh, he recently caused a smack up. Uh, which I think is what they call it in Britain, or, or a smackdown, as we call it here, uh, in the English press uh, by saying he wouldn't write a children's book unless he'd had a brain injury. <laughs> and that rather upset several children's books, book writers. He published his first novel, The Rachel Papers, in 1973 at the age of 24. It won the Somerset Mom Award. He has since published 12 others, including, uh, among others, the widely admired novels Money, London Fields, Times Arrow, The Information, House of Meetings, The Pregnant Widow. He is additionally the author of two collections of stories and six works of nonfiction, including The Second Plane, Coba the Dread, The War Against Cliché, which is one of my favorites, um, as well as uh, a spectacular memoir, Experience, in which he describes, among other things, his complicated and uh, very moving relationship with his famous father. His latest book, the very funny uh, novel he is here to discuss, among other subjects, I suspect, uh, this evening has the title, Lionel Asbo, State of England. It is uh, a story about a sociopathically uh, violent, uh, uh, porn-obsessed, uh, pit-bull-wielding criminal yob and unsuccessful criminal uh, debt collector who w suddenly wins 139 million pounds in the national lottery with, I must say, gripping consequences. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Amos moved to Brooklyn, New Jersey last year with his second wife, Isabel Fonseca, herself a novelist, uh, and their two children. He has another daughter by a previous marriage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you give a warm Toronto greeting? And I know that is not a contradiction, as is sometimes, <laughs> as is sometimes uh, uh, believed, uh, given our reputation, uh, to Martin Amos. Well, it's oh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, among the second happiest people on earth, uh, in the most envied library system on earth. So, and I think the. Is it the busiest li library system in the world? Yes, the busiest library system. Um, anyway, it's very nice to see you again. Uh, welcome. Uh, congratulations on the new book. Thank you. A fantastic cover. Looks like the Daily Mail, I think, is the, or the Sun, yeah, isn't it? This is the English cover, which <laughs> I don't even see. Yeah. So that pretty much says it all right there, doesn't it? You know. um, just before we begin, I, I just wanted to quickly ask you, uh, having spent 40 years uh, as the... Um, as fodder for the gossip pages of uh, the English media, um, have they forgiven you for moving uh, to Brooklyn? Um, no, uh, nor, nor are they likely to. Uh, it's, it's best if you're a British writer to have nothing to do with America um, because they're, they're raring to go on that question. It was interesting because as I was leaving, we were, and we were leaving for purely family reasons, and in my case because my friend Christopher Hitchens at that point looked as though he might um, 
have many more years to live. And that did not happen. But um, I made, I, at every opportunity, I said, it's nothing to do with any disaffection for England, any disappointment, um, dissatisfaction with England. And I said, said that again and again, you know, at boring, ad nauseam. And, and the press was sort of, so he's off to England, is he? Well, he can well, he well, you know, <laughs> stay there. You know. um, and it's, it, it's because it, anti-Americanism is not unknown in this country and um, is rife in Europe, but perhaps it's most intense in England where the politicians, by the way, are all Atlanticists and uh, believe that our des British destiny lies with the Americas. Um, but the people, or the press, let's say, um, have never forgiven America for becoming the world hegemon after the Second World War mm. and displacing us. Uh, well, I, I want to get to that um, if, uh, uh, quickly, um, and, we're, and you, if we're going, uh, Martin is going to read uh, ha about halfway through, and then he'll come back and we'll talk some more. Um, but I, I mentioned that move, and I know you, you've often said, frequently said, you did it for personal reasons. Um, but it has been coupled by some reviewers with Lionel Asbo, The State of Britain, um, and you yourself have called this book, and I'm. I'm quoting without my glasses, um, so I might misquote you, which we've, we're doing a lot these days at the Globe and Mail. You know, we've got a... <laughs> Somebody else got this quote. I just want to make that clear. Uh, <laughs> you have called this book a metaphor that perfectly captures the state of Britain's moral decrepitude. Uh, you've said it's a book about the decline of my country and the rage caused by that decline. The second bit of that is true. The first bit isn't. Is there, it's not true? No, no. I would, no. <laughs> well, tell me about that decline and, and, and what it looks like, and, at least as, as represented by this character. Um, well, it, I, I would steer away from any suggestion that this is a, 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 a diagnosis of England's ills or, or an analysis of its uh, etc. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a my take on what England is like, but that's what I'm most interested in is the characters and the situations. I, that's a sort of tacked on subtitle in a way. But whenever you, whenever you have to think about England's, England and its place in the world, what else can you say that um, it is characterized by decline, a very dramatic decline? Uh, and it, it's sort of not polite to say this in England, but it's a full-time job looking the other way. Um, <laughs> And I don't mean everything's falling apart. I mean, historically, even during the, during the Second World War, FDR and Stalin, at those meetings of the big three, they were meetings of the big two. Um, and they, those two actors were already snickering behind their hands at Churchill um, because England didn't, didn't weigh anything anymore. It was, as a world power, everyone knew it was over. And it then had to divest itself of empire, leaving various ticking bombs all over the Middle East and, the, and Central Asia um, in a hurry and settle into um, second echelon status, which it did with the end of empire was a, was a terrible uh, scurry for the exit. And you know, there were, in the subcontinent alone, there are a million deaths caused by partition and, and the problem of Iraq and Israel, all this has been bequeathed to the well. Um, and the, the pious chant at that time from England was, we will be Greece to America's Rome. Uh, and they've, they've realized how, how little their voice matters, except in one in instance when uh, George W. Bush was about to go into Iraq, um, and by the way, isn't it obvious that he, the reason for that war was re-election? 
Karl Rove said to him, you know, quietly one day, do you want to be re-elected or not? Uh, no, no American president who's uh, prosecuting a war has ever been kicked out of office. Um, anyway, uh, Tony Blair suddenly assumed huge proportions around that time, early 2003. It took me a while to realize why he was being pushed into the limelight so much is that George W. Bush needed someone to say, to approve of the Iraq war in an English accent. <laughs> um, and having done that, you know, he was pushed once more to the side. But I would say, you know, this is, this is of, of great moment now, how England has coped with its decline. And it's, a, it's not a bad lesson on how to do it. Um, without much, with, with a fairly realistic sense that this is really happening um, and has happened. Whereas America, which is scheduled to be overtaken by the Chinese economy in 2045, so it will, the American century will have been an exact century, 1945, 2045. Um, I don't see them doing it quite so, you know, stiff up a lip, um, won't apply to America. It'll be a whimper of um, illusion and, and flailing, I imagine. Uh -huh. uh, it's not clear if America is in the, you know, going to decline at that rate. And it's very hard to measure. And I would risk uh, obloquy here by saying that most historians agree that it's been, American dominance has been a force for good. Um, no wars between the great powers. Great suffering in the third world, but um, in proxy wars. But the gravitational example of America has meant that the number of democracies in the world has gone up by from 30 to about 120 in this period. Uh, the model is, is liberal democracy, and it won't be that when China uh, is prepotent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, sitting uh, as you were, I guess, in London, uh, w seeing what was going on in the city about you, <coughs> does the rage you, you say that that decline has caused, how does that, that rage result in a guy like, like who is Lionel? He's, he seems to be obsessed with money and criminality and, and pornography, and that's pretty much it. But he says every now and then, he says things like, a once proud nation, um, he is aware of decline. I mean, it's very, it's, it's very hard to detect and, cra and track this uh, anger and disappointment in the old sense. Disappointment used to mean not, not getting what you want, but having something you've already got taken away from you. Um, but it, it must be at the heart of the England's curve. Um, because it's, it's so dramatic, from a quarter of the globe being um, our, our property to, to a struggling post-imperial power. Um, and I think it comes out, you know, human beings don't like disappointment in that old sense. Uh, and we all have to go through it. You, you rise, as all empires do, and then you decline. Um, and the form it takes in the citizenry is, hard, is again, you know, very hard to identify. But it, it becomes, it, it seems to me that it becomes, what happens is that you, since your voice no longer matters in the world, you become uh, obsessed by superficiality and surfaces and triviality. And that's... That's what's happened in England, it seems to me. It sort of stares you in the face. So like a, a lottery winner, it's unearned. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the, the, there's a great population of people in Britain and elsewhere here as well um, who are famous merely for being famous. Um, and it rests on no achievement or even pretended achievement. And I think the lottery winner is, has to be high up in that. Uh, hierarchy. It, it, I, I heard that Threnody, Threnody is the uh, is the assumed name of a of a glamour model uh, who becomes his his it, it, based on a real person. 
No, she's um, the p person people think she's based on is um, Katie Price or Jordan, uh, the the model and um, prolific biographer. And I read about <laughs> nine volumes of her her bio biography, autobiography, um, <laughs> just for sort of general background. <laughs> but. But no, my, my character, Threnody, who's a poetess as well as a, a topless model. Um, <laughs> and she has a line of, uh, she also has a line of um, underwear, does she not? Yes. Called, called uh, self-esteem. Self-esteem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she's, she's pathetic because she's a wannabe Jordan. Uh, and I discussed this with my sons. Uh, I said, I've got to call, she wants to be another character who flits around in the book. I said, I've got to name her after a river. Uh, and we, I was very attracted to calling her Volga. <laughs> <laughs> but thought that would be a bit too easy. So she's called, she's called Danube in the, in the, and Threnody is a wannabe Danube. Yes, she hates Sobel Dream. Um, does, does Lionel like being rich? Um, he it's seems... not clear, is it? No. Uh, he, uh, w I mean, he has a, he has a, he doesn't have a t titanium card. He has a, an yttrium. An yttrium card. Yeah. <laughs> and he, his handmade shoes cost 20,000 pounds a piece and that, yeah. that, that kind of thing. Yeah, he likes all that. And um, there's a terrible scene where he gets his, he's got five brothers called John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Stuart. <laughs> Stuart Sutcliffe, the forgotten Beatle. And they're all penniless with um, uh, shattered wives and uh, rioting children. And he gets them, he gathers them at, uh, at the most expensive hotel of London. This is his first day out of prison. He's in prison when he wins it, wins the lottery. Um, and he says, he, he sort of says teasingly, teasingly to them, uh, I spent 10 grand today, Get on, guess what? And they said, what? Socks, he says. Um, and then they go out to the garden after dinner and Lionel says, you know, I, I'm going to take care of your number one worry. You know, I know you're all tense, lads, he says. He's the youngest, but they're all terrified of him. Um, and he says, uh, what's, that, what's that little itch that wakes you up at night, that sort of thing that keeps you from sleeping, the, the worry that never goes away? And he said, it begins with an M. 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 Uh, can't say it, he says to them, and, and they're, they're speechless with, with greed and fear. And he says, Mum. <laughs> oh, Mum. I'm going to take care of our Mum. Uh, <laughs> So it's, uh, it gives him the chance to be meaner than he was before. Yeah. yeah. The book does begin with, uh, with Des, who is 15, having an affair with his grandmother in, in yes, distant. Yeah, that, uh, that it's not ideal, this arrangement. <laughs> he said, he's writing to an agony aunt. The book begins, I'm having an affair with an older woman. She's a, she's a lady of some sophistication. <laughs> and makes a pleasant change from the et cetera, et cetera. But there's one problem and one problem only, semicolon. She's my grand, exclamation <laughs> mark. Um, but Des is, in fact, the nicest character I, I've ever created by quite a long way. Uh, <laughs> I think that is true, actually. I, I think it is yeah. true. And I construct his, his story so, so that you forgive him for that. And he does. That's when he's 15, but we next see him when he's 18, and that's all over. Huh. Yeah. Youthful folly, really. Yeah. Sleeping with your yeah. grandmother. Can always, and she's only, by the way, she's only 24 years older than he is. She's a, she's a gilf, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't go into that now. I, I, I want to ask you one more question um, before, before you read. Um, you are a... As I'm reminded every time I, I look back over your work, which I do with great pleasure frequently, a very prolific writer. Mm. I know you deny this, but despite the fact that you write your first drafts, at least of your novels, in longhand, yeah. 
still. Yes. And it's it's um, a bit superstitious, maybe, but I feel that the, the flow, the sort of, it's like the flow of your blood. And I only use a, a BIC, a, a ballpoint. That's your only man. That's all you need. Um, <laughs> But I, I do feel that it has to be that way the first time round. And, th and then on the computer, which seems to have been invented by a novelist, it's almost sinister how it, it uh, answers to a novelist's needs. You know, I, I still think, you mean I can just insert a paragraph between these paragraphs <laughs> without retyping five pages, which is how it used to be. Yeah. Um, and then I revise. But I, I don't like writing something straight down on a computer, or you have to have that that first draft and um, longhand, and also there's something that the computer can do if you're very patient, but you don't automatically do it, which is you keep the evidence of your original crossings out. So you'll come to an ad adjective and reject one and put in another, and very often the first one was right, and that's all still there on your longhand draft. Uh-huh, right.